right. Well, it is 10 o'clock. We've got some folks still coming in. So we'll just do our uh, introductions. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all here in 2022. Glad we're all here and we've, we've made it to another year. So that's really good. Um, welcome to the Bentley Rare Book Museum's virtual Coffee with a Curator program. Um, if this is your first time attending, then uh, welcome. So glad to have you here today. And if you've been with us before, you're one of the regulars, thank you so much for coming back in 2022. Um, so for those of you who saw my email earlier this month, um, I let you all know that we're now going to be on a monthly basis instead of a weekly one. And it's again, not that I don't absolutely love doing this program, but I just wanna be able to make sure I have time for um, some other things that I have coming down the line that, that y'all will hear about later. So some really exciting things happening with the Rare Book Program here at KSU this year. So there'll be um, some additional ways that you can engage with us in addition to this program. So now um, uh, we're, but we're still gonna have really amazing programs and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun because I'm gonna have some more time to get you know, more people um, involved as well. So that'll be great. And um, I'll make sure everyone stays informed about the schedule. So uh, this week we are celebrating um, the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, we had MLK Day on Monday but uh, KSU is celebrating, has a kind of a long-term celebration. And so this program is actually part of that, which is awesome. Um, so in collaboration with KSU's initiative and of course the federally recognized holiday, um, I want to wish you all a happy MLK week is kind of what we're, what we're doing over here. Um, so today we're gonna explore a text printed by and about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And all the texts that you're gonna see are actually part of the Bentley Rare Book Museum's collections. Um, and I'm gonna put a link in the chat if you are interested in learning more about some of the programming that KSU is doing for MLK Week, or you think you might want to join in. Some, I think some, many of them are virtual. Um, I don't know, there, there might be, um, a few in-person programs, but I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat if you're interested in um, some of the events that KSU is doing. So before we get started, first, we are going to, of course, do our Where's Andrew segment. So for those who are new, uh, we have a, a special segment every week. Andrew Bramlett, can you just raise your hand just in case? Okay, there we go. There's Andrew. So every um, Every, at least every month now, I guess, but every time we have a, a session, Andrew changes his background to a bookish place that aligns with the theme for the day. So of course, we're talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. today. So Andrew, would you like to um, give us any hints for today or? <laughs> well, today is, is, is connected to MLK. Um, as you can see, it has some nice wood paneling and this is actually a painting that is actually a bit bigger than this, but it didn't didn't all fit behind me. Mm, okay. All right. So it has to do with MLK. So I can pinpoint, um, I would think there are some locations at least we can start with. So the obvious one, I don't know, is it in Atlanta? <laughs> it is not. It is not in Atlanta. Okay. Um, I'll let someone else guess a location. I have a, I have a backup location. Anybody have an idea? If not, I can say mine. Um, is it in New York? It is not, no. Boston? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Birmingham? It is not Birmingham. It, okay, is it at Stanford? No, and it's not Selma either. In the chat. <laughs> Chicago? No. Not Chicago. Look, I'm exhausting my um uh okay. Well, I don't know if this is going to make it too difficult. I mean too easy, but is is this related to um a personal element of MLK's life or is it more related to his activism? Like the the a bit of both. A bit of both. Okay. So 
in that Which I know case, does not help in the least bit. But. I know, but I was thinking like, mm, is it is this a place where he was educated? No, no, it's not. I didn't think so. I guess so. Um, is it in uh, Memphis? It's not Memphis. No. Okay, I feel like we've guessed a lot of major cities. Yeah, it's not a major city, so. It's, it's that, not a major that, city. Yeah. So that's why. Is it in Wisconsin? It is not. <laughs> this is really hard, and I didn't think it was going to be hard, I have to admit. Um, I don't know, Andrew, is there um, any hint that you can give us Maybe because I don't I don't think I'm I think I'm on the wrong track here. 1944. Oh, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Oh, 44, 44. So I'm going to cheat a little bit because I have in my notes that he began his freshman year at Morehouse College that year. Does that have anything to do with this? Unfortunately not. No. Okay, well, he was 15. Yep. It, a bit, it was actually 14 when this event took place. Oh, he was 14. So, you in the year. Hadn't, yeah, hadn't turned 15 yet. Yeah. Oh, dear. Okay, well, I think that I am probably, I don't think I know enough about that period of his life to make an educated guess. I am in, of all places, Dublin, Georgia. It is in Vines County. And that is where he gave his first public speech in April of 1944. The Lawrence County Heritage Center is about, is about half a mile or a couple blocks away from where he gave his speech. Wow. Oh, that is awesome. And Andrew, that's a really good one because there, I think we all can agree there's so much known about Martin Luther King. So it can be easy to pick a place, you know, that everyone has seen. But I, I had no idea. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. That's a that one is round of applause for Andrew. That was a really, really great one. That's a hard one to, to find. That's really great. And it's, you know, it's in Georgia. So that's really great for us. And as usual, Andrew has dropped a handout um, about the actual venue, about the place, so we can learn more about it. So thank you again for that. Well, that was really great. Um, so we will go ahead then and, and proceed with our program. Um, again, uh, I think it's safe to say that even though we all didn't know exactly, we didn't know about this place, I think it's safe to say that um, we all know of Dr. King and know uh, what he stood for. We most likely know him as the leader of the African-American civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s and as a champion for nonviolent activism. Um, I think especially here in the metro Atlanta area, I feel like his legacy is almost tangible. Um, cause we see it represented in the archives, museums and libraries and cultural centers that are in our great city. Um, we even see them in sometimes specialty jerseys worn by our Atlanta Hawks. We see them, we see him represented in murals. So, um, it's, it's amazing. He, he is everywhere. And, um, I think on a more personal note, I mean, some folks may even have in this group may even have remembered um, hearing Martin Luther King speak in real time or you might, might have been very young, but um, even so there may even be some more personal connections there. So I'm not I know we all know of Dr. King, but I'm just going to first start off with a few facts about his life just to give us a refresher. On January 15, 1929, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta to Martin Luther King Sr. and um, Mrs. Alberta Williams King. He was born at 501 Auburn Avenue. Some of us may have visited his childhood home before here in Atlanta. Um, and he and his father were actually born as Michael King um, and then later went by Martin Luther King um, Jr. and Sr. respectively. Um, his father was also affectionately known as Daddy King, was a minister, and he became pastor of Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church in 1931, so short, shortly after Martin Luther King Jr. was born. And in 1944, Martin Luther King Jr. began his freshman year at Morehouse College at age 15, and we, we know now that he actually gave his first public speech in Georgia earlier in that year, so that's great. And then in 1948, he received his BA from Morehouse and became assistant pastor at Ebenezer. 
He then and secured another bachelor's in divinity and then began um, at Boston University in 1951. And he was awarded his doctorate from Boston University in 1955. That's why I guessed Boston earlier. Um, in 1953, so in between there, he married uh, Coretta Scott with whom he had four children. And then in 1955 through 1956, he gained um, public notoriety for his leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott. So we're thinking that that's the, the Rosa Parks event and all of that. So that was what he led and really um, brought him into the public eye quite a bit. In 1958, his first book, Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery bus boycott was published. And in 1963, that was a big year. He penned Letter from a Birmingham Jail in April. He published a book of sermons called Strength to Love in June, and he delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech in August. So big year. The following year, in 1964, he received the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and in 1968, um, he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee by um, James Earl Ray. And uh, in 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed into law um, Martin Luther King Day, made it a federal holiday. So those are just, again, just a, a very a quick brush over his life. Um, doesn't do anything to talk about the richness and the fullness of all that he did. Um, but just wanted to give you all a few highlights. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier today, we're going to talk about um, elements of Dr. King's life that are evinced through his, his writings and also writings about him. So that's also going to be really, because there's a lot of writings that he, he did, but also a lot of writings about him. Um, so let's start with his writings. Um, and so Andrew, I had Andrew do some research for me, um, and he created a wonderful handout that I'm going to use tomorrow at an open house program. But uh, one thing that Andrew found, Andrew, can you tell us the amount of books Dr. King wrote versus the amount of like speeches that he wrote? So the books was a grand, massive total of five, which, I mean, that's more than I've written it. That's certainly quite impressive. Um, but with speeches is really what he did most of, which is 2,500 mm -hmm. um, speeches and sermons were given over his lifetime. Some of those, I've, it seems like might have been, or he used a different speech multiple times, but still he he gave 25,000 speeches, which is certainly quite, that's the impressive part. <laughs> that is very impressive. Absolutely. And I think it also speaks to, is when I heard five books, I thought, really? Only five? I guess in my head, I was like, but then I was thinking, I think that actually speaks to the fact that, I mean, he was on the move. And um, it also speaks to the fact that I think his delivery of text was just as important as the actual writing. I think there are some people who choose to express themselves mainly through the words on the page that, you know, they, they want readers to, to engage with. But with Dr. King, I think, again, like his delivery was also what people were seeking um, in addition to uh, his his written word. And so um, I want to start off today because, oh, yeah, Andrew. Uh, I one, thing, one thing I found, I don't remember the exact number, but at times he'd be giving two or three speeches a day. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and see, that hits home for me because I think, you know, after like I get stressed when I have to you know, speak to two classes in a day. I'm like, oh, I can't do anything the rest of the day because it feels like it takes so much out of you. So that I, I wow, that, and that's, that was be an, ex, it was exhausting. I mean, an exhausting life that he led and um, a great one, but an exhausting one. So I wanted to show y'all, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the Civil Rights Digital Library, but it was an initiative that um, kind of uh, came out of the University of Georgia back in um, around like the uh, 2008-ish, around that time. And when I was actually entered UGA in 2009, and the, the purpose of the Civil Rights Digital Library was to make content from the, uh, usually audiovisual content, um, from the civil rights movement more available to the public and more accessible to educators and to pair it with education guides. So that's, that was what got me into the world of archives. So I had, special place in my heart for the Civil Rights Digital Library, but I wanted to show a clip. It's a very short clip made possible by the Walter J. J. Brown Media. I never get their name right. Walter J. Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards Collection held at UGA. 
So I'm going to share my screen and we're just going to get to see this is from 1962 when Dr. King is speaking at Albany. I believe he's speaking in a church. And I just want us to get an idea of his delivery, because for the rest of the period, we're going to be talking about his writing and we're not really going to get to hear him. Um, so I wanted us to kind of, again, get that sense of him speaking and, and why it was that was so critical. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, let me see if I can get this working for us. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to turn up my volume just a bit so that y'all will be able to hear it better. It's... All right. So it starts off with a choir, or not really a choir, but with a congregation singing, um, an assembly singing, and then Dr. King speaks. So I will get it right to... Let me get it to where we need to be. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see? Yes. Okay, great. For what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter when he doesn't earn enough money to buy a hamburger or a cup of coffee? What does it profit one? to be able to go to the swankiest restaurant in Albany, Georgia, when he doesn't earn enough money to take his wife out to dine. What does it profit one to be able to go to the hotels of the city and the motels of the highway when he doesn't earn enough money to take a vacation? So again, it's a short clip, but I think it gives a sense again as to how important his delivery was. And we all kind of know, I think we've just from hearing, we know that intonation that he had and that that rhythm. And at that point, he was speaking in Albany, Georgia, about the connections between the civil rights movement and also economic justice. So um, two things that were, I think people forget, were quite intertwined in his activism, not just about um, civil rights for African Americans, but also for um, uh, uh, just fair um, economic opportunities as well. So um, hope you enjoyed that little clip. Again, that was the Civil Rights Digital Library and I can put that link in the chat a little bit later. So um, I wanna show y'all something. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before. Um, this is called the, um, this is a Testament of Hope, the Essential Writings and Speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. So the, it's a thick book. A big one, but this is really how I, um, I think, was introduced to Martin Luther King's writings 13 years ago when I was tasked with reading a selection of these writings for um, a research program that I was in um, at UGA. And um, it was amazing because this is literally, again, this is the essential writings of Dr. King um, by, you know, edited by um, by one person. So it doesn't even come close to everything he wrote. But as we can see, was a very prolific man and it's almost hard to choose. So um, it, this is a book, I've kept it on my bookshelf because it was so special to me and I get to see what I've highlighted and what I've written in back, you know, when I was um, 18 and what I thought was important. And it's interesting to kind of reread some things now with some of them have new relevance. Um, so that's really exciting. I don't know if anyone, if you, if anyone has um, any special connection to Dr. King's writings, please do um, raise your hand, put it in the chat or just unmute yourself. I want this to be a conversation. Um, so if you wanna share, please do. Um, but again, we're gonna start talking about Dr. King's writings in the Bentley. So I'm gonna show y'all some things that we have and I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna be really exciting. So I, I wanna go ahead and share so I can all right, so I mentioned when I was giving um, kind of my little facts about Dr. King, I mentioned Stride Toward Freedom, 1958. This was Dr. King's very first book. And in this book, he recounted his leadership of the Montgomery, Boys, Boy, the Montgomery Bus Boycott of 1955 to 1956, okay? So we have a first edition copy of this book in the Bentley. Um, and I am going to read 
um, in the dust jacket, um, just a little, a little part. And we all know, remember, if you've been attending this program, we know it's important to keep dust jackets. Very, very important because they increase the value of our book. But also dust jackets, in addition to having really interesting, you know, photographs and images, and they often have um, historic bibliographic bibliographical information, historical information that you, you just won't ever see anywhere else. And I'm gonna read a little portion of the dust jacket from inside, because normally on the inside, it has a, you know, a little summary of what you're about to read. And the inside of the dust jacket says, part of it says, here is the full account of the Montgomery story that began as a bus strike and ended in a Supreme Court decision and the first successful large-scale application of nonviolent resistance to an American situation. So that is how the part of how the dust jacket describes this book. Now, how did it get to the Bentley Ware Book Museum? And then how did we have this A.D. King copy library? I know you're curious about that. Well, I'm going to talk about that next. Well, this came as a donation, along with many other Dr. King-related texts, um, from collectors named Mr. Frank and Mrs. Betty Sparty. And Frank Sparty um, collected books associated with Dr. King, including texts about Dr. King, um, and those that were owned by his family members. And um, Mr. Frank Sparty actually graduated from uh, KSU in the 1980s. And when he learned about the Bentley Rare Book Museum, he wanted to give these books of, that he'd been collecting to his alma mater. And in uh, circa 2003, the 2004 year, he actually did that. Um, so we see here on the paste down, A.D. King copy. Does anyone know who A.D. King is? Anyone familiar with kind of the King family um, genealogy a little bit? Alberta. It, that's a really, really good guess, um, but it's actually a different person. That's a we do have one actually with Alberta's uh, with um, claims to be Alberta's copy too, um, but this one's a, a different A King. This is actually Alfred Daniel King. So this is um, Martin Luther King's younger brother. And it's funny because um, this is his younger brother by one year. And one of the things is I've, I was doing a lot of reading on A.D. King. And, you know, as you all can imagine, he his family kind of felt that he had kind of been forgotten because, you know, he was kind of in his older brother's shadow all the time. Um, but a lot, usually he was right beside his brother doing activism with him, but nobody really took notice of A.D. King because they were often so focused on Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so this says A.D. King copy library um, or A.D. King library copy, excuse me. So I don't know if this that was written by A.D. King. Um, I would probably need to go into archives and I haven't really found where A.D. King's papers are. I think they belong to the King estate. So I would need to kind of go in archives to see if this matched at all with his handwriting. So A.D. King may not have been the person who actually wrote A.D. King library copy. However, what I do know is that when this material was donated, it was formally appraised and its provenance was confirmed as belonging to the King family and was part of the King estate at one point. So we can, we can, um, trust that this was associated with his family. We just don't know if A.D. King actually wrote that particular note on the paste down. So it's good to just be aware of what you know and what you don't know. But this is a title page to Stride Toward Freedom. And uh, again, Dr. King wrote five books and they were all published by Harper and Row. So we see Harper and Row was his publisher. And I also noted, I didn't get a picture of it, but he dedicated this book to Coretta and he called her my beloved wife and coworker, which really shows that he viewed her as a partner in this fight for racial justice. Um, and this book contains some interesting, some of these iconic photographs like Rosa Parks getting fingerprinted. So again, this book is talking about the success of the Montgomery bus boycott and how they made it happen, but also again, includes some of these photographs of these key figures as well. And of course, this is at the bottom there. It's um, 
E.D. Nixon, who was really involved in um, leading as well the Montgomery bus boycott. All right. So next, this is something a little different. This is, I put this under Dr. King's writings kind of in a different way. So um, this is a broadside, and I don't know if anyone is familiar with the, with the term broadside, but a broadside is basically um, a, a printed work that's cut on a one side of a single sheet. And this is actually, Dr. King did not um, produce this or publish it, but this is an interview. And I, I just acquired this a few weeks ago, so I'm really excited about it. I acquired it from a rare book dealer who kind of specializes in these kinds of things. So this is a broadside published by um, or that's published in Challenge. And Challenge was the official publication of the Young People Socialist League. Well, the Young People Socialist League was the youth arm of the Socialist Party USA. It was established in 1989 and it officially dissolved in 2010. So we can we can kind of tell even before we look at anything. I don't know if I can zoom in, maybe I can. Okay, great. So before we even look at the content, what do you notice here, what, what I'm tracing? Oh, creases, old lines. Exactly, which is very common for these kinds of materials. Um, this is something that we would put in the category of ephemera. And ephemera is, are really referring to printed texts that were meant to be very temporary. They were meant to be used in that moment. And this is this is that <laughs> um, it's just on one sheet printed. We see it's on pretty pulpy paper as it's gotten quite dark. Um, it's you know this is kind of dark newspaper like paper. So um, this was really meant just for that moment. It wasn't meant to necessarily be kept this long. So it's actually a miracle that it's still around and it's still even though we see these creases are weakening it, we're still able to read it. And we got to keep it folded outward, not not folded at all. Kind of keep it laying outward so that it does not fold anymore, or else it might break. Um, and now it's actually fitting that this publication is called Challenge because that's exactly what they do. Um, they really question Dr. King in this interview and they do in fact challenge his philosophy. Um, for example, they actually question his use of the nonviolent strategy that is made famous, that was made famous by Gandhi. Um, they assert, they say, hey, we don't think that this is gonna work considering African-Americans are the minority in their country, unlike people of Indian descent in India. And so they talk about that with him throughout this, um, but Dr. King respectfully rebuttals. And he says, well, that would only be an issue if the interests of the majority were different from that of the black minority, but they're not. That racial justice is a compelling issue that impacts all Americans and it's critical for the well-being of this entire country. So it was interesting to kind of hear that interplay, but um, mainly he was also talking about his new book. At, at the time, his new book, his first one was Stride Toward Freedom. So they talk a lot about that as well. So I think that's really cool, kind of seeing it in a moment in time. They want to interview him. And again, Dr. King then was, he was, he had gained public notoriety, but not to the, he didn't have the legacy that he had now. So it's interesting to see him be interviewed by this, you know, this young group of people. And he, he took this interview and I love that. Um, and so that's, that's an example, I think of, um, and also they, you know, being, you know, of course the, the group he's talking to, he spoke a lot of, you know, he made a lot of connections about racial progress and labor movements, which is something that I know that they were interested in too. So um, I just really love this piece of Dr. King's, um, writing and his his story that I think um I just this is not this may you may not find this in some official publications um or or in any book of essential writings of Dr. King but I think it's just as important all right so I'm going to try attempt to there we go okay next we're going to move on to another writing many of you have seen this before because we love to bring it out um, but this is a strength to love. I mentioned um, when we were going over Dr. King's uh, some facts about his life that in 1963, um, he published Strength to Love. 
This is a book of sermons, and it's currently on exhibition in the Bentley Burr Book Museum. This is a first edition, and we see this is also a donation from the Spartys, the same people that had all those books um, that were associated with the King family. And we see on the front um, free end paper, we have an inscription. And this has been authenticated as being, of course, from written by Martin Luther King. And it says, to my darling mother, whose love and support have greatly enriched my work in civil rights. So he inscribed this book to his mother, which is a beautiful, um, a beautiful um, intimate moment that we're allowed to see through this inscription. Now, what I think is fascinating is that in the preface of Strength to Love, Dr. King remarks that he did not originally want to publish this book because it's a collection of sermons. In his view, sermons are meant to be delivered or spoken. He was urged by his colleagues and friends, though, to publish this, and so he finally conceded. But I think it's kind of cool because even he was aware of the difference between people reading his work and him actually delivering it. And so, um, but I have, um, I have a lot of students who really respond though to reading this book. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And I think, you know, we're, we've heard Dr. King speak on documentaries and on footage. So sometimes you can almost imagine him, him speaking uh, the, the, what, what you're actually reading. You can almost hear his voice. All right, so I'm gonna, any, and again, if anyone has questions or comments, please do unmute yourself or put it in the chat. So this is something a little different. Um, of course, we do not have the original copy of a letter from a Birmingham jail, um, but what we do have, I think is really interesting. We have a memorial copy. So um, this was a copy, this is a fine press work. Um, it was made especially um, to commemorate Dr. King's, um, to commemorate his life after he was assassinated. Um, we acquired this uh, memorial copy from a well-respected book dealer in 2017. Um, so of course the letter itself was written in 1963, but um, again, this, this copy was not made until 1968 um, in memory of his death and in honor of him. Um, I think what is really interesting that they did with this with this fine copy is they added in the on the left the public statement by eight Alabama clergymen, and then we have the letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, and it kind of I didn't scan the whole thing, but it continues. The reason why I think this is important is because I think we forget um, letter from a Birmingham Jail um, was not written in isolation; it was a response letter to literally to eight Alabama clergymen that were attempting to dissuade King and other organizers from proceeding with the Birmingham movement. They were telling them to wait and to, you know, to just be patient. And this is causing a lot of uproar and trouble. Trouble. And Dr. King was responding, literally he was from in a Birmingham jail at the time and was responding and explaining why they cannot just, sit back and be patient any longer and why this has to continue. So I really like that in this, um, this memorial copy, they included both texts. So you can kind of see exactly what Dr. King is responding to. All right. So does anyone have any comments about, those were just a couple of writings by Dr. King in our collections that I wanted to highlight. Um, does anyone have any, before we move on to writings about Dr. King, does anyone have any comments or questions or thoughts about what we saw? Or if you have a Dr. King quote or passage that you really love, I have one that I'd love to share, but anybody else? I've been talking a lot. I wanna make sure anyone, ha if they have comments that, th that they get a chance to see them. Um, I just wanted to say I'm currently looking, <laughs> I have a picture somewhere, I can't find it, of um, a, a flyer I came across in one of the archival collections that I was processing. It was just kind of um, 
random. Like there weren't a lot of other things that had to do with it. Um, but it was a flyer for, um, it was after Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. Um, there was going to be, um, there was supposed to be something held here in Atlanta in replace of him coming to visit because he had just died. And there were a lot of really famous people participating um, but I can't explain it because I can't remember exactly what it says. So if I find the picture, I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maggie. Yeah, if you find it, please do let us know. That would be great. That sounds, and that's, that's, and again, that sounds like a very kind of, I'm imagining it as more of an ephemeral text, something like announcing, you know, I, I think those are the best. Um, that's great. Um, anyone else? Yes, I wanted to share a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> my name's Ellen Freeman. I'm Joy Ellen's mom, and so happy to be here. Um, just a couple of things. First, a little bit of a testimony, and then I have a little book uh, I wanted to share with you. But my introduction to um, Dr. King was actually, uh, I was probably six years old, and I always remember this, um, when Dr. King was assassinated, of course, being six years old, I didn't really know who he was. I didn't know anything about him. But I remember um, just it seemed like my whole world changed uh, because I saw my mom go really just mourning and in shock for about a week. And I still vividly remember that. Um, so, you know, my time being introduced to him, of course, I learned a lot about him as I grew up in and went to school, but my introduction was really that moment in time and his assassination and kind of seeing that through the eyes of my mother, through the tears of my mother. So that was my introduction. But I do have um, a book I wanted to share. I, I've, I've had it and I believe it was given to me, I think at a church that I went to. And this one is called The Words of Martin Luther King Jr. Selected by Coretta Scott King. And I have the dust jacket on it. And it's, um, it's just got, I guess, some of his writings and ex excerpts from his writings mm -hmm. that Coretta Scott King selected. Um, there's lots of um, dates, uh, copyright dates on it. The latest one being I think 1968, but Joy, I would have to show this to you so you could kind of analyze it, but I've had this for many years. So oh, that's yeah. what I wanted to share. I'm so glad you shared that. Yeah, we actually, I believe we have a copy of that in the Bentley. Actually, I didn't, I didn't bring it out um, for this particular program, but that's really cool. I didn't know you had that. Um, yeah, because we've we've got a copy here as well, and and yeah, I think for a, a lot of folks, I think it's interesting that you said that. Um, you know what you said earlier. A lot of people, you know, young folk, you know, people that are were young at the time, they're probably their introduction to Martin Luther King might have been just kind of that that kind of trauma of you know hearing about his assassination or at least sensing you know something was wrong in the household or something um, like that. So. That's a very real experience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, anyone else have anything that they'd like to share? If not, um, oh, Barbara. You know, are there publications? That is a great question. Barbara asked, are there publications or collectibles related to the fun raising and building of the MLK monument in DC? I would feel like there are, um, you know, I don't know enough about kind of how that came together to know where those documents would be. I'm going to make, but I don't know, maybe even the Smithsonian Library of Congress has some of those materials because that was, you know, quite recent, I would say, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I'm sure there are. So that's a great question. Um, very important, too. Um, that's a great one. I wish I knew the answer to that one. That's, I'll have to look into that for you. Um, the only other thing I want to share before I go on is that I definitely have, it was, it's kind of, it was hard to pick because I love Dr. King's writing. 
Um, it just really speaks to me. I love the amount of metaphors he used and just the rhetoric. He, I just really respond to it. But one thing that I, I think my favorite writing of his is actually, it's a very sad um, occasion, but when Dr. King gave the eulogy for the four little girls who were uh, murdered at um, the 16th Street Baptist Church um, when the bomb went off that was placed by the Klan. And I mean, I can't imagine being tasked with eulogizing, you know, the joint funeral that I think three of them had a joint and then a, a, I think one of them had a separate funeral but um you know I just can't imagine being having to keep your composure and then also I, that was one month after the march on Washington so you're coming off of that and then you feel like you know another a huge setback there um but I really love this one part of his speech that I think is so encouraging and it makes me emotional most of the time, but I practiced it so that I wouldn't cry on camera. Um, but this is a part of the eulogy that I really love. And some of you may have heard this before. At times life is hard, as hard as crucible steel. It has its bleak and painful moments. Like the ever flowing waters of a river, life has its moments of drought and its moments of flood. Like the ever changing cycle of the seasons, Life has the soothing warmth of the summers and the piercing chill of its winters. But through it all, God walks with us. Never forget that God is able to lift you from fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope and transform dark and desolate valleys into sunlit paths of inner peace. And I just always get really encouraged by that. Um, so I think that is my favorite excerpt of Dr. King's writing. Um, and I had highlighted it with a pink highlighter back when I was young, so I still resonate. So that's my favorite. Um, so if anyone doesn't have any other comments, um, you know, I think that we can go on and talk about some texts that were not written by Dr. King, but that were written about him. And one thing I love about the texts we have here at the Bentley that were written about him is that they they show relationships. I mean, they are like, they're top notch. And so I can't wait to, to show these to y'all. So I'll go back to. Oh, Ellen, I finally found that picture. Can I? Oh, you did, yeah. Screen? Can you share it? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Um, can you guys see that? Nope. No. Yeah. Hold on, did I? Make sure you have sharing ability. I think you should be able to share. Oh, there, there we go. go. Sorry, guys. Okay, see, it's just a, um, an ephemera flyer. Welcome to the Poor People's March to Atlanta at the Civic Center. Um, to hear Mrs. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and national entertainers help make his dream come true. And it's after his death oh. in May. So I think this was probably, and then Gladys and the Pips were there, little Stevie oh. Wonder. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were handwritten on the flyers, you know, and um, the Temptations and Supremes. I just thought it was really cool. It was like he wasn't able to come here to speak. So soon after they put together this Poor People's March, mm -hmm. I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, because he was working on the Poor People's Campaign when he was um, kind of, he's, he'd been working on that. And I know he was, um, you know, of course, when he was in Tennessee, but in Memphis, that was for the sanitation workers strike. And yeah, and I think he was, this was part of his work as well. And, you know, I wonder the handwritten um, celebrities that are there, I wonder like, after Dr. King's death, do you think that they were able, do you think people kind of wanted to come you know yeah. more people wanted to come and i think that they uh, as of may 9th i mean as of when they made this flyer for may 9th they had national entertainers mm -hmm. but i think that as it got closer to the date more people started getting added to the list of entertainers maybe oh, yeah. and so they just wrote them in i don't know That's i mean i'm not sure who wrote those in they're they're not handwritten directly on the paper. This is a, a photocopy. And right. so I think these were written on before the photocopies were made and before the flyers got put out on, you know. Yeah. So this is awesome. This is what I love about archives. We see all the drafts and everything and mm -hmm. see all coming together. That's amazing. I'm so glad. Thank you for finding that, Maggie. I know that was kind of hard to, to dig for that. Thank you for making that happen. 
I couldn't find it anywhere. I had to go to my stupid Instagram page where I posted it. <laughs> I love it. But so you found it. So yay. That's great. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, oh, Joy Allen. Yes. I'm a little late, but I wanted to just, I found the second book I had quotations mm-hmm. of Martin Luther King Jr. So um, mm-hmm. I've had this book for quite some time as well. I want to say I got it maybe in a place we visited related to him, mm-hmm. but I did want to read a quote that I really love. Um, and it's just a book full of his quotes, full of quotes and things I guess he said. Um, and this one says, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into friend. So that's, that's, that's one I really like. That's just awesome. wanted to share that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. And I think, yes, I remember being a youngster and, you know, for a school project, you're kind of Googling famous quotes by Martin Luther King. So it'd be helpful to have, you know, a handy, a book that does that. Cause I know we all kind of have, are <laughs> sometimes looking for that. That's awesome. So I wanted to, okay, sorry. I'm just try, I'm trying to get this to work for me. Let's see if I can Okay, I think I'll be able to, sorry, screen sharing is sometimes more complicated than I want it to be. Okay. All right, so we're back. And now we're going to look at some writings about Dr. King and that um, that we have here in the collection. So this is one of my favorites. Um, Some of you may have seen this before. Let me see if you can zoom in for us. All right. So this is a letter that we see is written to Mrs. Alice Newton. And it's okay if we don't know who Mrs. Alice Newton is, because I really don't either. But we see who it's from. We see the letterhead, Mrs. Martin Luther King Jr. So uh, Ms. Coretta Scott. So this letter is dated January 19th, 1970, which I think is really significant considering, um, you know, MLK was dead at this point, but we had just passed the anniversary of his birthday. So we actually found this letter. um, And of course it's signed by Coretta. We found this letter folded inside of a copy of my life with Martin Luther King Jr. This book. Um, that was the, a first edition copy, which is written by Coretta Scott King, and it was published in 1969, right after, you know, shortly after Martin Luther King, uh, after his death. So this letter, apparently what happened, Miss Alice Newton, again, she lived in Marietta, but we don't know much about her. She apparently wrote um, Mrs. King a letter after reading the book and explaining, you know, what, how she felt about it. And it was positive feedback. And Miss King writes her a letter back. Um, Of course, we've never seen the letter from Miss Alice to Coretta because that would be with Coretta's papers. But um, we see that Mrs. King is appreciative of the heartwarming letter that Miss Newton wrote on November 10th, 1969. Thank you, Coretta, for giving us exactly the date. So at least we know more information about that. And... um, it's interesting because I, Miss, uh, Mrs. King is very appreciative of Miss Newton's feedback. And she talks about how important writing my life with Martin Luther King Jr. was for her. It gave her a chance to chronicle the life experiences that she shared with her husband and also with, with others. And um, it contains, the book contains photographs and it really served as a way to kind of process the life she had with her husband and that ended tragically with his death. So this piece is currently on exhibition um, and it is a beautiful letter. Um, it is a prized possession. And again, this was literally found inside of a book um, in the Southern Polytechnic State University archives collection that we assumed leadership of during consolidation. So we did not know it was in there and what a gem to find. So I absolutely love this one. And again, shows us some relationships. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get out of my zoom. Okay. I think I did it. Very good. So, uh, again, we're just look out for relationships and all these pieces that we're, I'm going to show. So next, this is, uh, lives to remember Martin Luther King jr. By Don McKee. This was donated to us by the Sparties again, and it's a biography of Martin Luther King 
but look what's inside. This was written on, um, let's see, let me make sure I say it right. Let me make sure I know where it is on the page. Okay, this was written on the front free end paper. And this says, um, it's from, uh, so this is Don McKee has inscribed it to Martin Luther King Sr. So that's Daddy King. And it says, some men merely have sons. Others are blessed with sons, but few men in history gave to the world such a gift as the parents of Martin Luther King Jr. On behalf of the human race, I thank you. And I remember the words he often quoted, and I believe with you, we shall be free someday, black and white together, for the brotherhood of men. Don McKee, December 24th, 1969. So we see this in a way, it's dedicating this to his parents. It's, it's giving them some comfort because their son is gone, but he's left a legacy that is un, unparalleled, unmatched. Um, but we also see that Don McKee is clearly familiar with Reverend um, Martin Luther King Sr. to, you know, they sound a little bit familiar to this inscription. Um, so I did some research and Don McKee was a news reporter who covered much of Martin Luther King Jr.'s activities. And so um, it was interesting because I noticed when I was going through the book that this short bibliography does not thank anyone in particular or like use archival collections. So I'm wondering maybe Don McKee had a lot of the information for his book kind of through his experience as a reporter because um, it doesn't seem that he drew upon a lot of archives. I think he might've had that info. So that gives us a little bit more insight, but I love that. And then this is the picture life of Martin Luther King Jr. by Margaret B. Young. This is also donated to us by the Sparties. This is a biography of Martin Luther King, another one, but this one is for children. And it's told heavily through photos. And then look, we have another inscription in here. Um, this one is to Mr. and Mrs. Martin Luther King. Um, and it says, brave parents of a great leader with warm respect and all good wishes that what he worked for will come to pass. Margaret B. Young, January, 1969. So again, we're seeing this common thread of 1969 because, you know, again, his birthday month in 1969, one year um, or not even a year after he had been assassinated. Um, and I noticed that the copyright page of this book um, here, it actually lists Mrs. Um, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. King Sr. It lists her, uh, you know, photographs courtesy of, in addition to Ebony Magazine and places like that. So Margaret Young must have had some kind of relationship with Mrs. King that she was able to contact her and get her, to, you know, get photographs um, or allow the use of photographs. Well, I learned Margaret B. Young was actually married to civil rights leader, Whitney M. Young. Um, Y'all may know his name. He was the executive director of the National Urban League. So again, we're seeing through these books, we're seeing connections between the King family and other activists and people that they knew and people that meant things to them. And again, like I said, this is for children. So you can see it's mostly a picture and then with a little bit of a caption. Now, this is another thing I wanted. This is very different. I don't see this very often, but this book was written by Charles Johnson um, in 1998. And this is actually a fictional text. We have this in the collection. Um, this is a fictional text about Dr. King. I haven't read this. Um, really interesting story though. It's told through the perspective of a man. So this, this, this um, imaginary man, this fictional man, he looks uncannily like MLK. And so he's hired to serve as MLK's double. And so we get a chance to see Martin Luther King's life through the um, perspective of his double. So I think that's a really interesting um, storyline. So um, we acquired this in 2019 from actually a local book collector who collects um, first edition novels by African-American writers. 
And so I was really glad to uh, collect this. I had not heard of this novel before that. This might be an interesting one um, that uh, I'm sure you can, if, you, if you're interested, I'm sure this might be a great one to acquire. I have not read many fictional texts about Dr. King. Um, finally, the last thing I wanna show you all is um, very different. And I don't, I know we live in a world where it's, you know, it's fearful the amount of misinformation that spreads and spreads so quickly. So I wanna show you all this with um, the knowledge that this is that not every text that was printed about Dr. King was positive. We're used to seeing the positive ones, you know, but a lot of it was not. So this is an example of that. And this is a text that someone had a view of Dr. King and they wanted to, um, to show this. But we actually acquired this text in 2015 from a rare book dealer specializing in um, political materials. This is called An Anti-Communist Negro Makes This Appeal. Please Don't Help Glorify Martin Luther King, written by Julia Brown. Well, Julia Brown was an FBI agent who worked as an undercover operative in the Communist Party for nine years. So um, uh, I think probably part of, you know, J or she was part of J. Edgar Hoover's team. And we all know that relationship with Dr. King was not good. And um, so anyway, she was working undercover in the Communist Party for nine years. And so in this booklet, she's trying to convince the public that she has seen and known that Martin Luther King had ties to the Communist Party. Um, she was definitely not the first person to accuse him of this. I don't know if y'all remember, but Dr. King was stabbed in 1958 by Azola Ware Curry. And she was a black woman who, again, was convinced that Dr. King was a communist. So this was something that this was, you know, where we have to remember that this was also during that time of, you know, Red Scare and communist scares and everyone thinking so-and-so is a communist. So this is also was part of the uh, America that Dr. King was living in. Um, and so this track was handed out. It has two photographs and it was um, distributed um, as I think part of this truth about civil turmoil committee or whatnot. And so um, it's just interesting to see that we don't often focus on, you know, um, it's a small booklet, but we don't often focus on printed texts that were merely negative um, or trying to um, uh, defame Dr. King, but there were those texts. And I think it's, um, and I showed this um, to just, I think it's important to understand the full landscape of printed texts about MLK. And um, in our collection, we want to document all of that um, because it, it did occur. And this is part of the historic record as well. So um, that I think gives a, a good understanding of kind of some of the materials that we have in the collection. As you can see, we have quite a strong collection, which is exciting and we're adding to it. Um, I did want you all to know that um, if you are interested in Dr. King's papers, um, there are just a couple places that you, if you wanted to, to go um, here in Atlanta at the AUC Woodruff Library, they, they house the Morehouse College Martin Luther King collection. I had the pleasure of interacting with this collection and working with it when I interned there many years ago, incredible collection. So the AUC has a collection and then on um, the King Estate, obviously the King Center has the majority of the materials. Um, Boston University, has some materials that were donated um, while Dr. King was still alive. That's because Boston University is one, of, is one of his alma maters as well. Um, and then uh, I did some research in the Library of Congress, Emory, New York Public Library. They all have bits and pieces too, because for example, Emory has the archives of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So naturally that's gonna have Dr. King. So they have bits and pieces, but the two big collections are AUC Woodruff here in Atlanta and um, of course the King Estate. They're the two big owners, I think. Um, now Stanford University has a, a King Center um, and they are working on publishing the King Papers. So they're working on publishing a 14 volume set of Dr. King's most essential writings and correspondence all like, so that's an exciting project. And um, if you all want to learn more about that project, I think it's still in the works and Coretta was very involved in getting this project going when she was alive. 
Um, I put that in the chat if you're curious about the Stanford University King Papers project, but that might be something interesting to follow. And I think they've already digitized some material um, that's publicly available. So um, anyway, I have to bring it back. If you wanted to know more about the archives, I wanted to make sure you knew where you could look as well. So thank you all so much. It's 11 o'clock. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to venture to campus because you have nothing else to do tomorrow, I will be downstairs outside of the Bentley Rare Book Museum at 1 p.m. Um, to do an open house so you can physically touch the materials that we saw today. So if you are um, interested, um, send me an email because I want to help you with parking. And so, um, so if you're interested, just let me know. Um, uh, and then just so that y'all know, our next program will be on February 16th. It's going to be really exciting. I'm not going to give you the topic yet because I'm still working it out, but it's going to be a, a great program. But thank you all so much for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing y'all next month. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.